Welcome to the Draftsman Podcast. I'm Marshall Vandruff, stands on paternity leave, but I'm interviewing guests and friends. Today's episode, April Solomon. Yeah. Hi, April. Hi, Marshall. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. This is the first time we've ever had a conversation with an audience. Are you nervous? A little bit, yes. But um, my nerves have, have simmered down somewhat. <laughs> okay. I'm a little nervous, too. And the audience does not yet know you, so let me introduce you. I've known April Solomon for almost a decade now. We have traveled together. She has driven me to classes in Los Angeles from Orange County, and she draws and paints marvelous dragons, among other things, but mainly dragons. April, where are you right now? Uh, right now, I'm in Laguna Beach, California. And this is your studio in Laguna Beach, California. Mm -hmm. It looks like a nice studio. Thank you. It's my bedroom slash studio. More of a studio than a bedroom. If it had it my way, I'd just take the bed out completely. Yeah. Never sleep. Stay up all night. Conjure up dragons. Frighten the children. Entertain the <laughs> grown-ups. Now, I want to talk with you about a number of things. Okay. I'm going to want to talk with you about your technique, your process, your imagery, uh, and as much as you are willing to about your life and your story. Were you raised in Laguna Beach? Yes. I'm born and raised Laguna Beach, homegrown, mm -hmm. grew up on top of the world, uh, which is a wonderful place to grow up if you're a kid growing up in Laguna Beach in the 80s. Yeah. Because you're surrounded by nature and the school there that I went to was just down the street. So, you know, you could literally walk to school every day. And and that was a great place because there was so much that wasn't developed at that time. So there was a lot of canyon, a lot of overgrowth from nature. And you could literally just run around and just build tree houses and catch lizards and make mud pies all day and just be a kid. And that was some really awesome times growing up. People might not know, top of the world is the top of the world in Orange County in a way. It's a, it's a mountain near the beach where you can see all around here. And uh, we went on a hike uh, back there and it is, it's, it's definitely wilderness. And there are rattlesnakes and do you ever have mountain lions around there? Surprisingly, no. And I'm shocked I never saw one because I was always playing in the canyon, you know, and I think back now, I'm like, oh, it probably wasn't too safe, but oh, whatever. I'm, I'm still here. So, your childhood was in Laguna Beach and in, if not a rural part of it, a part that was definitely connected to uh, wilderness areas. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your upbringing and what led you to be an artist. So, I owe a lot to it. Uh, to my dad. He's an amazing watercolorist. He's been painting watercolors for all of my life. I mean, long before I even entered the picture. He's been plein air painting for years. He's been showing his work at the Festival of Arts. And Festival of Arts is a show that's in Laguna Beach that's only for local artists. He was in that show for 35 years in a row. Wow. Yeah. So, he was a staple there. What's his name? David Solomon. There's a, a show that also goes on at that time called Pageant of the Masters. That's a show where they take paintings from the past and they they use real people and paint them up to look like the figures in a painting. It's really incredible how they do this. They set it on stage and they have this lighting and it looks like the real painting, but they're really people posing out the painting. And my dad was the first artist that they asked to actually do a live Pageant of the Masters painting of. And before that, they had only done artists that were long since gone. And my dad was the first artist that they asked to reenact wow. this painting that he did called The Life of Icarus. That was a big deal for him at that time. Your dad was an artist and still is? Still is. Uh, it has taken him a little while to get back into his painting because he had a minor stroke a few years ago. Mm. And it's affected his speech and not so much how he can paint, but he, it did put him through recovery that he had to take some time away from painting and drawing and just focus more on his health. And, and my mom, thankfully, is still around to make sure that he eats his vegetables and drinks his water and, and uh, 
keeps on the path of health. Uh, but yeah, my mom, she's not an artist, but she has always been supportive of me. Uh, I'm so lucky to have that because I've heard of plenty of art students uh, who have shared stories with me about how their parents didn't support them and how they warned them that it's not going to make you any money. So don't be an artist. Pick something else that makes you money. But not my mom and my dad. They've always supported me in my pursuit to be an artist every step of the way. So I'm really lucky to have that. Good. Well, that, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. Now, I want to ask something about influences. I've seen artists who don't find their imagery when they're in school, when they're out of school, competent artists who get hired, but they don't really have something that they brand themselves with. And you have very much gotten known around the people that you show your work to and at conventions, April displays at conventions, you've been at Animation Expo, you've been at WonderCon quite regularly. Uh, and were you at DesignerCon also? I was, just last year. And your productivity is so high, which is one reason why I want to ask you about your process. But before asking you about process, I want to ask you about your imagery. When did you make a conscious decision that you were going to specialize in dragons or was it even a conscious decision? How did it happen? Well, I knew since kindergarten that this is what I want to do. Really? I, I, I can even recall the first assignment that we had when we were asked to draw a tree. So, everyone was drawing their trees and I just got into it. Just started drawing the leaves and, the, and I put apples in my tree and I drew myself down. On the, I, I remember I was so like pleased with this drawing that I did in crayons and I remember just how good it felt. And I knew right away, like, this is what I want to do. And I just kept drawing, just draw. And I just kept drawing and drawing. And, and the inspiration just kind of found me. There was so much to be inspired by, especially when you're a kid growing up with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. And that was extremely popular in the 80s. I was born in 83. And during the 80s, that's when D&D &D was just starting to take off, I believe. And you could see it everywhere because, you know, there were bookstores and there were comic book stores too. And my dad, being an artist, uh, was an avid collector in a lot of books. And I would go up into his studio late at night when I wasn't supposed to. And I would look at all his Frazetta books and all the airbrush painting books. And I was just immersed in it. And he had Sargent books about watercolor. You know, and zoo books were a huge thing growing up. Yes. When, when I was a kid, it just, I had so many zoo books. I still have them all. I have them all behind me right here. Um, and nature books. Uh, uh, but yeah, Magic the Gathering, World of the Apocalypse. There was only specific places where you could find that type of fantasy art. And that was in bookstores in a specific you know part in the bookstore. That was where you could find it because I didn't have internet. I, I couldn't, you know, there was no access to that. So you had to really look. And you had to really find your inspiration that, you know, it could show me like there are people out there drawing dragons and I want to do that too. You know, and film also became a really big inspiration for me. A lot of animated films, mm -hmm. the early Disney films and, you know, movies like uh, Land Before Time and All Dogs Go to Heaven and Secret of Nim, you know, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, you know, Never Ending Story is a huge one for me. You know, there's just right away, I think, fantasy and and horror movies, like those really cheesy horror movies in the 80s that, again, you weren't supposed to watch unless your big sister let you stay up late, then you could. Uh -huh. You know, all that was insp inspiring for me, too. So, I feel like I got a lot of inspiration from a lot of different areas and just kind of, I just took it all in. Just, I felt like a sponge, just ready to absorb it all. And, and there was just so much there that I could draw on to use in my art. And, you know, so when I'd see, you know, a dragon in D&D, &D, I was like, oh, I, I want to draw that. Or you'd see a, a werewolf on America Wolf in London, you know, that transformation scene just blew me away. I think I was six years old when I saw that. And that really inspired me uh, to draw monsters. Dear. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it didn't freak me out at all. <laughs> This was not a conscious one moment decision. This was an osmosis phenomenon. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can say that. You picked it up from being around it. And uh, was there conversation with your dad, with your parents, with your sister, with anyone else about the imagery you were developing? Or was this entirely your dialogue with the work you were looking at and the work that you were creating? There was a lot of open dialogue. And I was really fortunate for that because my parents were so supportive and they got me so many drawing supplies and paper and I could just draw freely and they look at my art and they would, you know, look at it and go, wow, did, did you, did you draw this? Did you draw this? <laughs> and <laughs> that all encouraged me to draw more. Um, and a, a big thing that, that has played a part in this is uh, because my dad was in the show, the Festival of Arts in Laguna Beach for so many years. I wanted to do that too. I wanted to sell my art like he did. And I would get a cardboard box. And this is when I was like, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years old. I would get my pens and paper. I get a cardboard box and I make a sign that says art for sale. And I would sell my art in the festival. And I got in trouble every day for it because they told me that kids are not allowed to sell their art at the festival. You have to be a certain age. Well, I just pick up my box and I would just move over here and put it down there and I would just keep drawing and keep selling my work. So I got an early taste of it, you could say, that just influenced me to draw more because it felt really good to create something and other people enjoy what you're creating. And and that felt really good to to see people's eyes light up in that way and occasionally get money for it. And that was cool. Well, gosh, it's continued and it leads to two possible ways that we could go with this. Uh, well, we'll go with both of them. What are your primary media? I enjoy all of it. I love what each medium has to offer. And my favorite medium will change. It, it replaces one over the other sometimes. So, uh, I love pencil. I love pen. Ballpoint pen is so wonderful because it's so unforgiving. And once that line is down, you can't get rid of it. And it, it forces you to not sketch. You put the line down and you got to go with it. And it's, it's wonderful. I love that unforgiving process of pen. Um, and uh, so I, I love watercolor. I love gouache. I love acrylic. I love oil. I love it all because they all have a voice. You know, they all tap into some different part in me that it's a because they all have a specific look to it. So oil is, it's a different mindset than when you're working with watercolor or when you're working with gouache. And each one makes you so present, but it's it's also different. Like if you're painting with oil, you get to be a little bit of a sculptor because you, mm -hmm. you get to shape those, those brush strokes and you get to have the, you know, those lines and the texture that you can develop. And, you know, and the, and the acrylic is different versus watercolor. And it's, it's all wonderful and and depends on the project that I'm working on. And that will allow me to figure out what medium do I want to use to best express that piece that I'm doing. So that plays a part too. Yeah, I love your love of traditional media. I mean, just even what you just listed off there shows that you are familiar and intimate with the textures of every one of these things. I associate your work a good deal with colored pencil because you do have a lot of texture on those that seems like it layers over. And I, it seems like most of the pieces I've seen you work on, uh, partly because I've mainly seen you work when you are portable and moving from place to place and you pull your materials out and set up and colored pencils are so convenient and dry point and also the wonderful grit and texture. Have you ever noticed a pattern that you get done using this one medium and so you feel like you need now need something. This one's a little pointy. I need something a little bit more that covers an area. Now I want something that is thicker. Now I want something that goes into the fibers of the paper. Is there any pattern like that or do you just sort of ride the waves and not analyze them? I do ride the waves. I'm known for that. I, I'm I live on the whim of things most of the time. If it feels good, I just go with it. Mm -hmm. I don't question why. It's strange. Like, it depends on what I'm doing. But if I find something that really works, I, I go elsewhere 
and make sure that, oh, this is the thing that really works, but I want to check over here just to make sure that this is where I want to take it. Uh huh. So, like, for example, I love working on illustration board. Uh huh. Especially when you don't gesso it because it just absorbs the paint in just the right way and it can make acrylic look like watercolor a little bit. Yeah. And I really like that. And I like the slow build of the paint. Yeah. So, if I find something I really love, I'll step away from it for a little while and find something that's maybe a little uncomfortable for me just to make sure that this is where I want to finish or this is where I want to take my piece. One of the really cool methods I learned at LCAD is you take a, a sheet of, uh, it's a, it's like a vellum, it's like a mylar paper, and you take a drawing and you trace around it, and then you cut out the shape of that, of that drawing, and then now you have a stencil with the negative space in the middle, and you put that onto this paper, uh, or il- no, you know what? It's illustration board that's gessoed, so it's like super slippery and tight. There's like no tooth in it. I love that. And you take some graphite and you and you brush on the graphite on top of that negative space, and then you lift it off, and they have this perfect. It's almost look like you airbrushed it with graphite pencil. Yeah. And then you can erase it, and then you add to it. It's like a charcoal painting, and and that whole process is just so much fun. And I immediately saw myself, I'm like, I can't wait to do more of this, but I haven't done more of it since then. It's almost like I don't want to get stuck with one thing for too long. I want to try out more things before I find out my favorite thing, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes total sense. I, I've sensed that about you all along, that you are on the Myers-Briggs scale of uh, perceiver to judge. Do you know that? Uh-uh. P for prober or perceiver versus judge for closure. You're very much on the side of the uh, the prober perceiver, the one who wants to try things. Even like you said, when you know that something's uh, working and it's fairly safely working, you want to push the envelope a little bit and get into some territory where you're more challenged. I try to. Now, what you were just explaining about the graphite, it's using graphite not only as a drawing medium, but as a painting medium, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or you can lift it out. You can lift areas out. Yeah, that, that push and pull. And and it took me years to understand what that meant, uh, especially with figure drawing classes, uh, which I've been, I've been taking figure drawing classes since I was in high school. And I love it because, you know, you learn the fit. You, even if you're not an artist that draws the figure for a living, it teaches you so much about how to see and how to not think you know what that shape is because, you know, you think you know what a hand looks like and you, your subconscious wants to take over. But when you're working with charcoal and you're drawing the figure, it's, it's not just about applying. It's also about removing. And the removal of that is a, is a whole other, it's like you open up a whole other world. It, it, and like Photoshop, people can use the erasing tool as a drawing medium. It's not just about, why oh, I made a mistake. Now I got to erase it. You, you use that as, as a tool to create also, and it just adds so much depth to a piece when you think about it, about the positive and the negative addition to it. I love hearing you talk about the medium. Ah, good. <laughs> One thing that you have been strong on since I first saw your work, apart from imagery, has been technique. You seem like you don't need anyone to teach you anything about technique because you're going to experiment with it, play with it, push it, challenge it, run with it, uh, and love of textures. Keep going. Tell us other favorite media, favorite papers even. You mentioned uh, you mentioned illustration board. Uh, Crescent illustration board, I assume? Uh, Strathmore. So, really, I think it's the... I always get these confused. I think it's the hot press that's the really smooth surface. Yes. So, I don't like anything with texture. I would prefer it to be super smooth so I can get really nice detail. And uh, so, hot press illustration board or or gessoed masonite and you sand that with like a 400 grit so it's just like glass. And I love that surface. I mean, I, I love detail so much, but I have a tendency to want to get to the detail too quickly. And learning how to use big brushes first um, 
has been uh, a real big learning curve for me because growing up, I saw artwork that was so detailed and I wanted to capture that detail just like they, I love rendering. I could render myself into my own grave and not even know it and just keep going because mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. Yeah, something with no tooth because paper does bite. No, April, I, I am surprised. I am surprised to hear you say that. Because I assumed on a number of your pieces that the tooth of the paper was how you were getting the gritty texture. But now that you're telling that you want a, a surface as smooth as glass, that means all of that texture is coming from you doing a million little noodly lines and building the texture in slow motion manually. Uh, yes and no. Um, a lot of texture I can give credit to the texture in the paint, uh, in the oils or the watercolor <clears throat> that I'm using. Um, and much like what, you know, Drew Struzan does when he does his amazing paintings with the acrylic and the texture that he does. And then he, you know, draws to bring out the texture. Like he, he understands to just let the texture do the talking for you. I've been trying to get into more of that, but but yeah, using more of the painting medium as a, as a means of gaining texture rather than the surface providing it. So that when you put down some paint, it's like if you put it down with a paint roller, it's going to have a little grit to it. You put it down with a paint brush, it's going to have a little, uh, some of the evidence of the brush hairs in it. And so you put that to use. Mm -hmm. Yes. It does a lot of work for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that because uh, I found when I was a student, that working on the plate finish Strathmore, which was wonderful. Oh, I love that stuff. For its, yeah. Yeah, that's the hot press Strathmore paper that it was great for pen and ink because you could get such a clean line, but that as soon as you used colored pencil on it, Prismacolors in particular because they were so waxy, it was like working on wax paper is that everything would just slip off. Whereas as soon as we went to, well, they used to call it kid finish, as I recall, uh, but it was the cold press. It had just enough tooth to it to where if you were drawing something like a flannel shirt, you didn't have to render the texture. You would just let the color pencil run over the tooth of it and it would automatically give that flannelly look. And we grew to really love that and we found out that you could put a wash underneath there first and then put a complementary color or an analogous color over the top of it and get that sense of the layering. Uh, what else? What other media? Since this is this is for the world, and they want to know what media do you love? Anything else you want to tell us about art supplies? April loves art supplies, <laughs> and I'm sure that if we were to swivel the camera around your studio, your studio is the treasure trove of all of the art supplies you're going to find in one place in Laguna Beach. Tell us about any others that you love. Uh, I know I touched on it briefly, but I just got to say how much I love ballpoint pen. I think it's a medium that is, and it's growing more in popularity. It's a medium that can do so much for you. It's, and it's not something that you hear used in classes or taught in the school. It's, it's not seen as this medium, like a, like a, a, you know, a, a mechanical pencil or a tubey pencil or a piece of charcoal, you know, ballpoint pen, normally think about that's the pen you use to sign your name, you know, when you're doing your signature at the bank, but it does so much more. It can produce incredible shading and there's all different kinds. And if you apply a ballpoint pen to a piece of just eight and a half by 11 sheet of white paper, that velvet finish on that paper with the ballpoint pen that just glides across it like a like an ice skater and it <laughs> it leaves that pen that pen mark you just made not only is it permanent and it teaches you to not sketch but it you put the idea down with confidence and from there mm -hmm. I actually build my pencil I go in reverse it's interesting so I, I put the pen down first and then I go into pencil or, or color pencil and because it, it's, it's almost like I, I'm just allowing myself to engage with the piece rather than with the pencil, you know, I'm kind of sketching my way and, and I, I love pencil. There's a time and place for it. And, and I only used pencil for years because I, 
for a time, I really believed that I would never use color. Not until I got into junior high school. I used only pencil because I believed a true artist knew how to use pencil really well. And I actually forbid myself to use color for years. And I don't know where I got that in my brain. Like, no, I'm only going to use pencil. I'm never going to use color. I'm never going to use pen. I'm just going to use pencil. And I, I prided myself in that for a while, but then you get older and you start to realize, no, wait, <laughs> art is so much more than just pencil. There's pen and there's colored pencil. And there's, um, you know, in the beginning, when I first tried oils, and this was just in high school for my first time, I hated oils, hated it. It was, it was gooey. It didn't do what you wanted it to do. It was messy. You had to take the time to squeeze out the color onto the, t on the palette and you gotta make your color. And I'm like, okay, this is stupid. I don't like this medium at all. <laughs> um, and then I went into acrylics after that. And for me, that worked well because then I felt like I'd found a medium that dried quick. I could figure out how to mix color properly. And once it's down, it's down. I mean, I mean, there are tricks to that, but. But I felt like that was a good intro to painting for me was, was trying acrylics first and then getting into watercolor because then I feel like I have more confidence with paint in itself as a medium. And then 14 years later, <laughs> I get into oil again and I fall in love with it. Wow. So it was just a matter of when you were ready for it. And uh, tell us what you love about oil. There is such an intimate connection with oil when you're painting. It's like when you paint with oil, it's like you, I can feel this, this golden thread that just attaches my arm to the brush. And it's not just about, <laughs> I put the paint on, you know, you, uh -huh. you can hold that brush in so many different positions and each one's going to give you a specific gesture of sculpting the paint onto the surface and and even applying it it's and there's so many different mediums you can use with oil you know, every artist has their own concoction some artists just use oils as they are some people don't mix anything but i like to use a little bit of the uh the terpenoid or a gamsol the little bit of walnut oil or linseed oil just and so that gives me just like a perfect blending with the oil and it just it's like warm butter on toast yeah wow i'm feeling like this is going to be useful for people who even aren't seeing the pictures because of the fact that it makes you want to go buy oils and get some absorbent paper and some resistant paper and all sorts of different surfaces to experiment with. I mean, you're not the first person that I've heard who loves oil paint who has likened it to painting with colored butter. Marshall again with the client I've wanted to pitch for, The Great Courses Plus. It isn't that I've been listening to The Great Courses since the days of cassettes and CDs and before your parents conceived you. It's that their huge library is now online and there are so many titles that this could be more than a one-minute pitch. This could be two or three years of us mining the wisdom from only a few of these hundreds of courses, chosen discerningly made into what I think would be the most awesome, high-quality, lifelong education program we could get. But me telling you about how much they've been part of my life probably won't do as much as the titles. Here's where you open the course to be introduced to a whole world of resources on that particular topic. I'm doing that, seeking mutual interests, and you can get one month of all of the titles for free. Use our code, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash draftsman, I am kind of interested what Draftsman listeners would choose as their favorites on The Great Courses Plus. TheGreatCoursesPlus.com slash Draftsman. This episode is sponsored by Proco Drawing Lessons. If you want to learn how to draw, if you want to improve your knowledge of figure drawing and figure anatomy, look no further than Proco.com. There are hundreds of free lessons on our YouTube channel, but the premium courses over at Proco.com slash store have more detailed videos and a lot of assignment demonstrations. Our anatomy course also includes 3D models of all the bones and muscles that you can rotate around and study from right in your browser. It has PDF eBooks for each lesson so you can review the information whenever you want to come back to it. 
And if you're looking to save some money, we have several discounted package deals. Head over to proca.com and start learning. If you want perspective projects from me, January 2021, I'll do a workshop. You can get my feedback or take it for cheap and just watch. Go to my website, martialart.com. It seems to me that one of the most important things about mastering any medium is to love the medium, to love it so much that you want to work with it for many, many, many hours because you will. Why work with something? Why, why learn to play an instrument that you don't like playing? Well, it brings me to another question about this, April. You have a time-intensive style. Your work is not like it's a quick slapdash watercolor that takes adept brush work but never takes more than an hour to do the piece. You've got a lot of pieces that are extremely invested in many hours. Can you tell us the good and bad of that? I'll tell you the bad first. Um... The bad, because it is labor intensive, now more so as I've gotten older and started to learn tricks from, from my teachers about, you know, if you have an idea, first you do a thumbnail <laughs> and you figure out the composition first instead of just diving in, which I love to do because I, like I said, I live on a whim. So I love to just dive in. <clears throat> and I'll spend hours on a painting or a drawing that I end up not liking later on. And the ugly stage gets so ugly that I just, I take the drawing and I put it away and I might not revisit it in two years from now. I'll just even forget I even did the damn thing until I discover it when I'm cleaning out. I'm like, oh yeah, there's that painting I started that I hated. Well, it doesn't look so bad now. Maybe I'll give it another shot. And I have... Uh, been able to finish artwork that way. Uh, but professionally, that's probably not the best way to to put work out there. <laughs> so because it is labor intensive, now I'm learning the tools to get all the things in place to make sure that before you take the long journey or aka go on a hike, you have to pack your backpack with food. You've got to have water, food, good shoes. You need a map. And the thumbnail is your map. <laughs> the the color thumb the the color studies. That's like you know that's the water I need. Like I, I need provisions before I go on a long trip, um, because it is labor intensive. And learning the tools and taking your class also really helped me tremendously about understanding good composition. You know, because if I am going to commit hours and hours into a piece, I, I got to have an idea of where I'm going with this thing. So it doesn't get shoved under my bed for two years. And then I finish it later. Um, so, so that is the bad. The good is that I love it. I love that ugly st after the ugly stage has passed, and there are several, um, but there is that by spending all those hours of detail, it's only till after you've done all the work of figuring out the composition and the color studies and what you're going to do. And then after all that is done and you get through that ugly stage and then you start to get into the detail stage. Oh my gosh. I am so happy. I could just die. <laughs> I could die happy <laughs> just rendering my life away. I love it. Yeah. It's the dessert stage. Yes, <laughs> exactly. I sense that about you. You know, this is, I wonder whether since you are so productive, uh, when April does the the trade shows, her booth is filled with original art that she sells. And one wonders, how are there enough hours in your lifetime to do this much developed art? I've wondered whether all of those hours doing something you love that much is why you carry an aura of calm around you. <laughs> Do you feel that your work, when you work a lot, do you feel relaxed as a result of it? Do you feel blissful? Uh, when the painting is going good, yes, I'm blissful. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I listen to a lot of music when I draw or when I paint because I know that it, it plays a huge part into me getting into that space, into that fold of feeling really good and... I'm feeling really relaxed and really good. 
you know, music plays a big part in that for me, then I'm more likely to to want to sit there for hours and find that place to where I'm now I found a little slice of heaven when everything is going good. And I just now I'm ready to live in that place. You know, once you get on that inspiration train, you just you don't want to get off. Your passion for it is infectious. It makes people want it makes me want to spend the rest of my life in my studio experimenting with media like you do. Do you do anything digitally? Uh, I have some good friends of mine that have taught me uh, how to use Procreate. And I really didn't get into learning how to do digital till I went into LCAD. And I took a class there, learned a lot about digital and the importance of understanding it. I mean, you know, there's Illustrator and Photoshop, but Procreate has been a tool that I've used a lot recently because mm -hmm. it allows me to just get it down, just figure out that color arrangement, figure out the composition at a small scale and, and not worry about the details. Because like I said, a detail is something I can, you know, I, every time, I'm like a moth to a light bulb when it comes to detail. Yeah. If there's detail there, I'm going to sniff it out and I'm going to spend hours on it. And I know that that's not the point of, you know, when you're first coming, coming up with a piece. Uh, but I do some digital just to do a mock-up of what I think I want. Uh, just basically yeah. just come up with something that way. It changes the process though. Mm -hmm. And so is your process, do you have a set process which for every piece you tend to do? You, For example, you learned to work in stages before committing so that you've got things, you've got enough planning to keep you safer. You also seem like you experiment around a lot. Does that mean experimenting around have to do with how you approach a piece in a macro way from beginning to end? It's the same yet always changing. So the Procreate that I have now, that's new. That's something I just yes. started doing in the last year. And for a long time, Marshall, I swore to myself, I'll never go digital. I will be traditional forever. And then I have some very supportive friends in my artistic circle that have educated me through the years that it's just a tool. And it's important to learn all those tools, even though they might not be my primary tool, it's still a good idea to learn them at least. And, you know, and they're right, because now I have another tool in my toolbox I can use, even though I'm not a digital artist, it has really helped me to so just come up with something quickly. I would say for the future, I would hope that I continue to learn about Procreate and digital to just hash out some rough ideas. But then I'm going to take those rough ideas and then put it on paper and still keep them very rough and, and play with the medium, play with the, see how this looks in watercolor, see how this looks in acrylic, or how does that look in gouache, or how does that look with just a pen drawing and, you know, just, and still very much have my traditional uh, process still in there. Procreate is just there to help me hash it out quickly. And, and from there, traditional, I mean, I can't wait to get to traditional medium every time. Like Procreate, it's, you know, it's, it's the bike that I ride to get to the bus stop that I need to get to the place I want to go. <laughs> that's, that's what it is for me. <laughs> Well, it's great to hear that and, and in any encouragement since the world is digital, mm -hmm. you have something that others who work digitally exclusively do not have. You have original works of art. I have one of them, in fact. I own one, although I've never <laughs> – I don't have it yet because the <laughs> lockdown has kept me from getting it. But yes, the thing that made – part of what made me want it was the image itself, but also the fact that this is a real piece that you invested all that time in. Okay, we've talked about that you were raised in an environment of support, that your, your dad was an artist, that he still is an artist, that you had access to materials and inspiration, that you love particular media, that you've learned something about process. Tell us anything else that inspires you. Um, other artists, uh, tremendously. Name some that have been important to you. Oh, well, we could be here all day. <laughs> I know. I got a list. Let's get started. All right. Uh, Jeff Easley, uh, James Gurney, 
Donato Giancola, Dan Dosa Santos, Scott Fisher, Greg Manchez, Rebecca Gay, uh, Boris Vallejo, Frank Frazetta, uh, Norman Rockwell, Howard Pyle, um, uh, Sargent. Um, uh, let's see, I got a whole book right here. <laughs> uh, James Jean, uh, Terrell Whitlatch, uh, Joe Weatherly, uh, Drew Struzan, of course. Duh, don't forget him. Yeah, don't forget Drew yes. Struzan. <laughs> uh, J.W. Cooper, Paul Bonner, uh, John Howe, Solomoth Wolfing. It's the list just goes on and on. And every year I find new artists that inspire me. They inspire you. Do they affect your technique or your imagery? When you see someone whose work you like, do you say, hey, I could try something like that? Yeah, it's like, it's like watching the Olympics. And you see what people can do. It inspires you to try it too. And now you know it's possible. You want to look inside yourself and, and see, well, could I do that too? I mean, they have their own method of, of how they do things. But, but now you see what's possible, what you can create. And it inspires you to, you know, to, to dig deep in yourself and figure out, well, well, what, what's my voice? So what am I trying to say? And clearly, I mean, every artist has their own voice that they're trying to say. And, you know, only you can say it the way that you can. And I'm just trying to figure out what that is for me, too. Because if it wasn't for these artists, for the art that I've seen in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. Because that has been a huge inspiration for me, are these people who have dedicated their whole lives to making great art. And... You know, I hope that I can be one of them someday. That would be one of my greatest wishes. There is something about seeing somebody do something so well and then you feel like it resonates within you. I, I think I could do that. Uh, do you want me to tell about your uh, – who has sought out your work or do you want oh. to tell the story? Uh, you can tell the story. <laughs> it might have been the first – well, I don't remember whether it was the first or the second time that you were – you set up a booth at CTN. Oh, it's the first one. That was the first uh -huh. one. Okay. Uh, and for a first show at a convention for Drew Struzan to come by and see your artwork and buy one of your originals was, I don't know, sounds like a pretty big deal to me. <laughs> oh, you know what? No, I'm sorry. It was, uh, it was Designer Con. He, he bought my book uh, at CTN, but then him and his wife, Dylan Struzan, bought my original at Designer Con last year. Did you negotiate and like keep bringing the price up for him or, or were you pretty easy on him? <laughs> uh, Dylan and Drew and, and Dylan was the one. She said to me, you know, well, she asked me, how much is that dragon over there in your booth? Drew and I are interested. And I told her the price and she looked at me. She said, well, we love it and we'll take it. Yay! <laughs> I was like, ah! <laughs> Couldn't believe it. <laughs> Oh, it was such a privilege. Isn't that exciting to have had someone who you admire as much as him and of his stature to see your work and want to own an original? That must be a thrill. It's indescribable because, I mean, I grew up with his art. That was another book that my dad had in his studio was the work of, you know, Drew Struzan's paintings. And, you know, to have one of your childhood heroes actually want a piece of your art. Him and Dylan both wanted it. It's it's just such an honor and a privilege to have my dragon in their house. And they've, they've invited you over and you've gotten to know them as friends, correct? Yes. Was the book that you had, the Dreams for Sale one, that was the perfect bound, had a blue cover, had his hand drawing uh, something with a paintbrush? Does that sound familiar in a color palette? Because if it was around in your childhood, he came out with that book around 1985. Would that have been the one or is it one of the more recent ones? I think... I think it is that one that my dad had. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That was the book that came out when he did a show in Brea that was movie poster illustrators, but it was mainly him. And then he did a workshop shortly thereafter in Lake Arrowhead. And oh gosh, everybody was pouring over that book because that was the one collection where you could see Drew's work and the body of it. Can you tell us anything about your daily schedule and how your studio is set up? And is that an evolving work? So yeah, my daily schedule. And I love that you're asking me this because this is what I've wanted to know 
from my artistic heroes. It's like, what's your schedule like? How do you, how do you keep on top of it? Do you, do you stick with it? You know, like a regimented schedule, and do you show up no matter what? And you know, when do you work? When do you eat? When do you when do you take a break? And now I look at my schedule, and and I think of it nothing magical. So I try and wake up at the right time every day, the same time. Occasionally, I do sleep in because I stay up. I, I'm both a, a harsh night owl. And I love to wake up early, which doesn't give me a lot of hours for sleep. Wow. Yeah. But somehow I, I seem to thrive pretty well. The, not the, the normal rigorous amount of sleep that most people take. I, I can, you know, sometimes I'll get four hours in the night of sleep. And somehow I wake up with more energy that way. I don't know. I'm a freak of nature. Um, but, uh. So I, I do tend to do a lot of my painting and drawing in the nighttime. And my dad was the same way. I feel like I'm just so much more focused in the evening because now all the distractions are gone. There's really nowhere to go or things to do. It's, it's just it's nighttime and it's just me and my studio and the willingness to create. It's, it's like my muse loves the nighttime. And that's when I really feel that inspiration build. and. That, that's where I really feel like I sit down and I do good work is later in the evening. And I used to work till two or three in the morning because I was just so immersed in what I was doing. And now that I'm older, you know, I'll make it to about two, two a.m., not three anymore. And I, I really shouldn't be doing that. But I can't help it because I like it so much. And I do a lot of like other stuff during the day. Like right now I'm in school, I'm taking a creative writing class right now, and I'm taking a painting class right now with Donato, who is one of my hero of heroes. He's an amazing, very well-known fantasy illustrator and fine artist, and he's done so much work for book covers and tour books, and he's done conventions, and he does a lot of Lord of the Rings paintings, uh, all in oil. Um, and so right now I'm taking a class with him till the end of this year and I'm, I've already got my money's worth. <laughs> I'm only like in class two and that's been really helpful. So, uh, but during the day, a lot of it is, you know, and, and, and I do my best to exercise and stay healthy that way and drink lots of water and eat well and, and, you know, go walk around town or, but primarily a lot of my work is done during the nighttime. Because that's where I just feel like I'm really inspired to do it. Yeah, I think you're not alone in that. I think I've heard that so many times from artists. Mm -hmm. Or if it's raining. Or if it's raining. You mean when it's raining, you feel like you do better work? You huddle indoors? I couldn't be happier. Then then I'm just creating all day long. <laughs> I'm not waiting until the nighttime. I, and I've met a lot of artists that love the rain somehow. It just that so Yeah, because you're for, forced to stay indoors. So you just... You know, it's okay to sit down and draw now all day if you want to. It's okay. Maybe it's that. Yeah. And because it, because it's raining out there, there's a sense of security and comfort that I am in my warm, dry space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel that way too. When it rains, it means, okay, that's another excuse to stay in. Do you deal with imposter syndrome? Yes, I do. <laughs> How do you deal with it? My medication for that. Uh, communication has really helped me with the imposter syndrome. Like, for example, <laughs> my Patreon page that I'll be officially launching at the end of this month. So, officially October 1st is when it's going up. And I almost didn't start this whole process because I really, even though I've done so much research and I've talked to so many artists and I've I feel like I've gathered so much information about it and I feel like I'm ready. I still feel like I'm not. Like I'm like I'm not ready. And and I'm just an imposter that's attempting this thing and I shouldn't be doing it. And I texted my girlfriend last night and I'm like, I'm freaking out. I don't know what I'm doing. And she's like, You got this. It's okay. You got this. And you know, and that's like to me that's just huge because I'll tell myself things that I know are not true. That committee of voices in my head that tell me that I can't do it or I'm not ready or any excuse that I have to not 
to not hit play or to not press send or to not, you know, put the pencil to the paper, whatever it is. You know, all those things are like, I know are not real, but they're so convincing when you're in the middle of it all and you think that, no, I'm not ready. I, I can't do this. No. I, like even right now, talking about it really helps because it's shedding the light on the problem and the problem isn't real. It's just the stuff in my head. It's the committee of voices that tell me that I can't do it. And so reaching out to people and telling them that, you know, maybe I'm having a hard time today or just communicating about it and not being such an introvert that I don't reach out to people and ask for help. Um, that's been really helpful for me. Oh, that's a good answer. That's great to hear. You've got, you've got community. Right. Community. <laughs> it's very important. You can't get help if you don't ask for it and you are willing to ask for it. Even that is very hard to do. It is. It makes you vulnerable. Right. Exactly. One other big question for you. If, if you could talk with your 10 years younger self, hmm? what would you tell your 10 years younger self? Don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did you take yourself too seriously? I do. It's all tied in with perfectionism. I always want to try and put out my best work or my best this or my best that. And sometimes it it stagnates me and then I just don't do the thing because I'm so, because I think, oh, it's just not there yet. I'm just not ready yet or it's just not perfect enough. Or I haven't, you know, and then I don't end up doing the thing and then that's even worse. It's better to do something halfway instead of not do it at all. I would tell her it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. It's going to fall into place. Just keep putting, putting the effort forward and it's going to be okay. You're, you're going to make it. You're, you're not as bad as you think you are. <laughs> and learn to enjoy the journey. That's, I got, I got to take my own advice, Marshall. <laughs> um, I would tell myself, enjoy the journey because the location is only 1% of it. Have you ever been to Maui? I have never been to Maui, no. But you have, I bet. I have. And when you do go, I'm sure you'll go someday, uh, there's a trail called the, the Road to Hana. And the Road to Hana, if you take the road, and it's just a road that weaves you around the jungle, and there's all these beautiful waterfalls, and the scent of flowers is always in the air, and everything is green like dinosaur Jurassic green and the and the town called Hana at the end of this journey is a very small town there's like a few houses and a couple of hotels but it's like a spot you want to go to because it's the trail that gets you there that's the most beautiful spot but if you don't take the time to see all the waterfalls and all the beautiful gifts that are lying just on the side of the road to Hana the road from where you are in Maui or, you know, Lehi or wherever you start to Hana, it's, it's, it's over within an hour and there was really nothing special about it. It's just a road. But, you know, you got to savor the moment to understand that it's not about the destination, it's the journey. That's the most important part. And, and that's a reoccurring theme that I've seen in many things in my life with Many conversations that I've had with artists and with people in general, it's, it's always about the journey. That's really, that's where all the meat is, you know? You, the destination, that's, that's only so special because you know that it took you so long to get to the destination in the first place that makes it so special. So I've, I've got to remember that and I forget all the time until this, until this interview. So thank you. <laughs> yes. And now, yeah, you're reminded of it and you've also reminded everyone who's listened to this uh, and inspired. Thank you, April. Now, we want to let the listeners to this podcast know how to get hold of you and what you're going to do. You mentioned that you have started a Patreon so that people who care about the artwork you're doing will know what you're doing and be able to see it as it's finished. Yes. And they can support you. Yes. Okay. How do they know how to get there? Uh, so my username is April Solomon Art, and that'll be the name. And that's the name I use through all the platforms, through Instagram, 
Facebook. Uh, Twitter is April Solomon Dragon Lady, but everything else is April Solomon Art. And that'll be the name I'll use for my Patreon page. It's taken me so long to build up the courage to, to even get this far. Because, <laughs> um, you know, to be honest, Marshall, I, I just, I really want to finish. There, there are projects I really want to finish. And I know that if I put myself out in the public eye and announce it, this is what I'm working on, then I'm more likely to finish. Yes, it's a deadline. It's a deadline, right. I'm giving everyone a deadline <laughs> for me to be held accountable to. It's a relationship with your patrons, which why they call it Patreon. It's a relationship with the people who care about your artwork. And so this will begin that uh, in an international way rather than what you've done which is to be a lot of point of contact in person. And now that everything's been locked down, you can find out about April Solomon and you can be a part of what she does with her Patreon. We did it. <laughs> we did a Draftsman podcast together. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <Ooh. laughs> Thank okay. you so much, Marshall. We'll keep in touch. We'll see you all. Thanks for being here.